Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me Dr. Nitin Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia is a spine surgeon who is the chief of spine surgery at University of California, Irvine. Dr. Bhatia did his undergraduate training at Stanford. He then went on to Baylor College of Medicine where he completed his MD degree. From there, he did orthopedic surgery training at UCLA. From there, he finished a, a spine fellowship at the University of Miami. Today, he practices complex spine surgery at University of California, Irvine. Good day, Dr. Bhatia. Thank you for having me. Dr. Bhatia, today what I would like to discuss is a concept um, that we're familiar with, but I don't think patients are sometimes familiar with, and that's when um, we have a condition called cervical myelopathy. Now, for you and I, that means there's too much pressure on the spinal cord, and we begin to see problems in the body, throughout the whole body, because of that increased pressure. But tell us a little bit about what, what causes that problem, how it presents, and how you begin to, to look at patients who have this problem. Sure, that's a great question. Cervical myelopathy is a problem caused by abnormal pressure on the spinal cord. The reason it becomes such a problem is because it can be very difficult to diagnose. It doesn't frequently show up as shooting pain in the neck or down the arms, but rather it can slowly uh, progress and cause dysfunction of somebody's hands, arms, legs, and feet. Usually it takes months or even years to gradually progress, where people go from being completely normal to gradually losing some function of their hands and legs. Some of the classic signs we see are problems using fine motor function of the hands. For example, buttoning your buttons on a shirt, holding a knife or fork. In Japan, the classic sign is that people can no longer use chopsticks that they've used since they were two or three years old because they lose that fine motor dexterity. Other common signs near the hands are numbness of both hands, and people can also have severe balance problems. I actually had a patient one time who was, had such bad myelopathy before he had surgery that he was walking down the sidewalk and the police pulled over to arrest him thinking he was drunk in public because his balance had gotten so bad. Usually it's caused by a problem of cervical spinal degeneration or what we call spondylosis. Now, now let's go back and define a few terms. One is, is the whole concept of cervical. We're really talking about the neck. Exactly. And, and we're talking about the seven vertebra that make up the neck. Um, this term spondylosis, tell us about that. What does spondylosis, spondylosis mean? Spondylosis are a fancy medical term for essentially arthritic changes of the neck. It's so, just, just with time, the discs and the joints and the other parts of the neck slowly degenerate and wear out a little. And that's what we call spondylosis. Okay. And, and arthritis, when you say degenerative arthritis, we probably ought to distinguish that between rheumatoid arthritis or some folks think of arthritis as, as a systemic disease that uh, uh, affects all the joints. But what we're talking about really is wear and tear arthritis for the most part. Exactly. And that's the most common arthritis that we see. We, you know, we call it osteoarthritis. Mm. And it's the typical arthritis that affects most people just as we get older. Now, you mentioned some people do have problems like rheumatoid arthritis, but those are much more uncommon um, and affect people somewhat differently. So, you, yes, it's the wear and tear type of arthritis. And, and you know, lots of patients come to us with, with neck pain, for example, and we tell them they have arthritis. Um, what makes the patient who develops cervical myelopathy different than the person that we see every day that has just neck pain from arthritis? You know, patients who come to me with myelopathy ask me that all the time. How come I have this myelopathy and this problem with my hands, but my spouse doesn't? They also have neck pain. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of good answers why. I, one of the answers is they're just a little more unlucky. They, their arthritis may cause more pressure on the spinal cord by constricting the space of the spinal canal more than other people with arthritis of the same age. Some people are also born with slightly smaller spinal canals than others, just like my hands or fingers may be longer, shorter, uh, fatter, skinnier than yours. Our spinal canals that our spinal cord travel down can be a little larger or smaller than everyone, everyone else's. And so if you're born with a slightly smaller spinal canal, which we call congenital spinal stenosis, you're more prone to having pressure on the spinal cord and spinal nerves earlier than if you're born with a regular size spinal canal. When I'm a patient, when should I become concerned? I mean, what symptoms should I start 
thinking about, well, gosh, maybe this is cervical myelopathy. The classic warning signs are problems with the fine motor function of the hands, numbness in both arms or hands, and problems with balance. Those problems are probably the early onset of them. Later on in the problem, you may actually see significant weakness or problems even opening the hands, as well as bowel and bladder problems. Okay, so it really does. It can affect the whole spinal cord. For sure. Pretty much the whole body. For sure. Does this ever get to the point to where you're, you're completely quadriplegic, where you can actually be paralyzed from the neck down? You can. And the way we grade it, one of the classic grading scales uh, grades from zero to five, and five, which is the severe end, is actually quadriplegia, where you're paralyzed from the, from the arthritis and the compression on the spinal cord and the resultant myelopathy. And, and this occurs slowly over a period of time, not, not all of a sudden at one time? Usually it's fairly slowly. People may get the first symptoms, say, one year, and then six months later they get a little worse and they stay at that level, and then they get a little worse. And it's what we call a stepwise fashion. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, people can have a rapidly progressive form of it. Unfortunately, just this week, I saw a patient in my office who, over the past two weeks, has gone from completely normal to wheelchair-bound because of his rapidly progressive cervical myelopathy. Really? And yeah. it was just from the arthritis type? That's that, that ex exactly. This got worse and worse. Hmm. Um, we, we talked a little bit about balance, you know, um, and, and you, you, you mentioned the patient who actually looked like he was, he was drunk. Define balance. I mean, is this where I'm just not quite as good on my snow skis anymore, or is this something that is really apparent to me? You know, it becomes more and more apparent. The, the cervical myelopathy tends to be a problem as we get older because it's an arthritis and degenerative-related problem. So we see it more, more in older patients than younger patients. Mm -hmm. And even without myelopathy as we get older, our balance gets a little off. But people with the balance problems for myelopathy we kind of walk like they're drunk. Their gait, instead of being uh, normal with what we call a narrow-based gait with their feet together, becomes wider. They tend to kind of lurch back and forth. They may even find themselves needing a cane or walker to balance themselves when they're walking. So let's say that I'm, I'm concerned. I'm, I'm starting to have some of these symptoms, and, and uh, uh, I've decided it's time for me to see a physician, and, and probably a spine surgeon. Or maybe I've seen my primary care physician and they've, they've said, you know, we need to send you to a spine specialist. How do you address that patient when you see them in your office? What's the tip off for you? And then what do you do next? You know, I, I think one of the most important things is getting that patient to my office. One of the hardest parts about cervical myelopathy is that these symptoms are kind of vague. People say, oh, you know, my, I'm getting a little more clumsy or I have some numbness but it's not always a distinct neck pain or shooting pain, so people forget to think about the neck. And unfortunately, a lot of times, I see people who had symptoms six months ago or eight months ago, and it's taken them that long to be diagnosed with a neck problem and end up in my office. Um, once they get to my office, we do a full history to make sure that the symptoms make sense and fit with what our thoughts are, and then do a physical exam and we're looking for abnormal neurologic findings that are compatible with pressure on the spinal cord. People can have abnormal reflexes, they can have weakness, they can have numbness, and they could have ataxia, which just means uh, poor balance when walking. Mm -hmm. Frequently we'll get x-rays, which will show arthritic change of the neck, but many people have that, and that in itself by no means diagnoses cervical stenosis, which is the nerve compression or the myelopathy, which is the nerve problems. So usually we end up with an MRI scan, which actually shows us the spinal cord and the space around it, or lack thereof, which is very important in making the diagnosis. Now, is that usually enough to decide what, what needs to be done in treatment, or are there any electrical tests or any other radiologic tests that you typically will get? Usually that's enough. Sometimes on, on patients who have a lot of other things going on, we may get other tests like an EMG test or even a, a specialized CAT scan. But usually the MRI scan gives us a very good picture of what's going on in regards to the nerve compression. Tell me a little bit about, uh, about the patients that you see. You had mentioned that it's usually the older patient that you begin to see cervical myelopathy. What's the youngest you could expect? I mean, is this, 
Can you start to think about this in middle age, or is it really an elderly problem? You can. We, like I mentioned, we see it more commonly as we get older. Mm -hmm. So in patients over the age of 60 years old, it occurs in about one in a thousand people. Younger than that, especially younger than 40, it's quite rare. Although some people are unfortunate in that they have this congenital spinal stenosis or spinal canals that are narrower than they should be, and even small amounts of degeneration can lead them to have these symptoms. That's quite rare, but we do see it, and I've seen it in patients as young as their early 20s. Once you've made this diagnosis and you've done the MRI scan and you're, you're relatively certain that the problems you're seeing, the neurological problems, are a result of the cervical myelopathy, what are my choices as a patient? Is this something that can be treated without surgery, or is this something that's going to require surgery? The only permanent solution is surgery. We have to take the pressure off of the spinal cord to stop the ongoing damage. Um, physical therapy uh, doesn't change that, although it may help some neck pain and may provide some improvement in the dexterity of the hands. It doesn't fix the compression on the spinal cord. That's really the problem. A lot of people won't even offer injections, such as epidural injections in someone who has this, because adding that extra fluid around the already tight spinal cord can make it even worse. Um, so surgery really is the only option for this problem. And, and when you recommend surgery, what are my expectations as a patient from the standpoint of, of what the surgery can do? Is this going to reverse the problem? The sooner we get to it, the better the reversal. So if somebody comes in and they have mild symptoms in their hands and we catch it early, they can probably get back to completely normal. But if somebody comes in later where they're or having to use a walker to walk, or maybe even in a wheelchair, they'll likely get better, but they won't go back to normal. So you can stop the progression of the disease, sure. but you can't really, you can't really guarantee that they'll they'll have improvement, and probably not complete reversal of the situation. Right, and and most studies show that the the progression of the disease stops very well, and so the official goal of the surgery is to stop progression. But most studies also show that most of the patients get one or two grades better. So if you come in as a grade two, which is kind of mild, you can probably go back to being normal at grade zero or one. Mm -hmm. But if you come in as a grade four, you'll probably go to a grade two and still have some mild symptoms. Okay. So you improve somewhat. And you mentioned the grading system. Uh, could you define that grading system in a way that I as a patient can understand it? I mean, how many grades are there in and what's a grade zero versus a grade two? Sure. The, the grading system, the, the numbers we use for people with myelopathy, it's officially zero to five, but the, the numbers that matter are one through five. One being just some mild pain, um, and it's graded based on how much we walk. So two is you're having some problems walking. Three is you're having problems walking and you require some sort of cane or walker, but you can probably still work. Four means that you, the walking has now gotten so bad that you probably can't work. And five means that you're essentially wheelchair bound. Okay. It sounds like that, that anybody who has a diagnosis of cervical myelopathy is going to end up with an operation. I, unless there's other reasons not to operate that makes it riskier um, than, than op it makes it riskier to operate than not operate. Um, Let's move on to, to procedures uh, that can be used to treat cervical myelopathy. What are my options in terms of, of surgery? What type of surgery is available to treat this problem? There are a variety of surgeries available. The fundamental goal of all of them is to take the pressure off of the spinal cord. Usually we, we divide the surgeries into surgeries from the front of the neck, which we call anterior surgeries, or surgeries from the back of the neck called posterior surgeries kind of a general rule of thumb, and this doesn't hold true for everybody, but a general rule of thumb is that if it involves two or less levels in the neck, for example, two disc spaces, the front of the neck probably provides better results with less complications. But if it involves three or more levels, surgery from the back of the neck likely provides better results with less complications. Now, obviously, each patient's a little different and their compression's a little different, that's a general idea of how the surgeries are done. Okay. Well, let's divide them into the front and the back, I guess, then, and, and sort of look at it first from the front. What are we talking about? I mean, what, what do you actually do 
when you try to go in and relieve this pressure from the front. When we come in from the front, we want to take the structures that are pushing on the spinal cord out. Usually it involves the discs, which are like the shock absorbers in between the vertebral bodies, which are the bones in the neck. Um, in between each bone and the bone next to it, there's a disc. With time, those discs tend to collapse, and as they collapse, they bulge out. It's that bulging that then pushes towards the spinal cord and causes the problems. So we need to go in there and remove those discs in what we call a discectomy to open up the space for the spinal cord. Now sometimes there's actually pressure behind the vertebral bodies as well because they sit in front of the spinal cord. Some people actually have ligaments back there. We all have ligaments, but some people's ligaments become ossified or actually turn into bone. Um, and cause significant pressure on that. And then we have to take those ligaments away. And, that's, uh, and to do that, we take out that small piece of bone of the vertebral body that's blocking it, and that's called a corpectomy. These procedures are very well tolerated. Uh, it's the kind of surgery, if it's just a discectomy, frequently the hospital stays at most just overnight. Some people even go home the same day. Um, and even if it's a corpectomy, which sounds like a much bigger procedure, most people go home the next morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, depending on your surgeon, people may not even wear a neck collar, and some surgeons put patients in neck collars for two months. I tend to put them in for about two weeks just uh, until the skin's nicely healed, and then they usually don't need a neck collar after that at all. So, so after you take out the disc, or if you have to do a corpectomy and you take out the corpectomy, what do you do at that point? It, it, obviously, you've got a big gap there. Exactly, and we have to do something with that gap. We know if we take out the disc or even part of it and don't fill it with something, over time, that disc will collapse because the stabilizing force has collapsed. And maybe over six months, one year, or two years, the neck gradually falls forward and you end up with more and more problems. So we have to reconstruct that area that we've opened up. And we, that's what we call a fusion. And usually what we do is we take bone from the bone bank or bone from the patient's hip or a, a mechanical device that replaces the disc and the bones that we've removed that allows the bones to have uh, rebuilt stability and allows them to heal together with essentially once they're healed as much strength as they did before surgery if not more. And so basically if I can paraphrase what, what you're saying is that you take out anything that appears to be causing pressure on the spinal cord and then you come back and, and replace that with bone graft or something that is narrower than what you took out, so that you've made that space bigger for the spinal cord. E exactly. Now do you use metal plates or any hardware when you do that, or do you just put the bone graft in? You, I, I use metal plates and hardware because we know the results, especially for more than, if you have to do more than one disc, mm -hmm. are better if you use the metal plates and hardware. Okay, so, and you're using the metal plate mainly to hold everything in place while it heals. Exactly. D do you ever go back in and take those plates out? Sometimes you can. Rarely patients will want them taken out because they just don't want them, and very, very rarely they'll cause um, some, uh, problems with swallowing, especially in patients who've had problems swallowing before that. In that case, we may take them out, but it's, it's extremely rare to need them taken out. Okay. It's not something you tell patients, and, no. and you would discourage that, I'm assuming. Yeah. If they, you don't need it taken out, we just leave it in. Yeah. So I, I, think I, I think I understand that piece. Let's move to the back now, and, and, and what's available from the back? I mean, are we doing the same thing? The procedures from the back of the neck are a little different. Instead of going in and taking the discs out, we can't do that from the back of the neck, um, mainly because it's, it's somewhat unsafe. Um, but what we do is we open up the space for the spinal cord and allow it to move away from the discs and the things in the front of the neck that are pushing on it. It's what we call an indirect decompression. And it works wonderfully well. Mm -hmm. um, there's really two main kinds of it for myelopathy. One is called a laminectomy where we actually cut away the bones over the areas where the spinal cord uh, has pressure on it. And nowadays when we do a laminectomy, we usually do a, a fusion as well. And a fusion is where we put the screws and rods in to hold it in place. And the reason we do that is we know if you don't do the fusion with the laminectomy, the neck again will fall into that forward position over a few years and you'll end up in a lot more trouble than you started in. A second procedure which I tend to prefer is called a laminoplasty. And in that, we don't actually remove the bone. What we do is we cut the bone and create a hinge, kind of like in a door. So one side is partially cut, whereas the other side is cut through and through. 
we then open it like you would open the, the hinge of a door, allowing the spinal cord more space to move away from the compression. The real benefits of it is you don't need a fusion because we've maintained the bone and the neck doesn't fall into that forward position or kyphosis. And you don't need the screws or rods. Um, and it works very well and is a very rapid procedure. It's actually not that commonly done in the U.S. simply because many surgeons are not trained in it. It's very commonly done in Japan where they see many, many cases of this myelopathy because of some genetic uh, predisposition that they have to it. And it works wonderfully well for them. Do you think that's changing? Do you think more U.S. surgeons are beginning to adopt the laminoplasty technique uh, now that they see how well it works? Undoubtedly. And in fact, uh, our group has, has published and presented some of the biggest um, series of patients with laminoplasty. And after we first presented them, I got calls from uh, my friends who are very good surgeons around the country and said, you know, thank you for showing that because it's not something that we're taught or even talk about very much in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And it really provides us another great option for treating these patients. And you mentioned that the difference between whether you choose going from the front to the back really determ is determined more about how long a segment of the neck is really involved. That the shorter segments you do better from the front and the longer. Why is that? Why, does, why do you tend to do better from the front than you do with the back? Any explanations for why? The main reason for that is that when we come in from the front of the neck, there's not a lot of muscle that we have to get to to get there. In fact, if you push on your neck here, you feel kind of a firm structure. That's the spine. It's mm -hmm. fairly close to the front of the neck, which surprised me the first time I found that out 10, 15 years ago in medical school. And so because there's not a lot of muscle there, there's not a lot of soreness after surgery. In fact, most patients say that it doesn't hurt them at all. Um, there's very low complication rates when you've got only one or two levels to do because the healing of the reconstruction or fusion part heals very nicely. Once we go more than two levels though, it's harder for the body to heal all those levels of reconstruction um, consistently. And so even if two out of those three levels may heal, the third one may not. And that can lead to problems down the future, although it doesn't always. So in that case then, the, the going through the back and damaging that muscle is probably less of a problem than trying to get all that bone to heal in the it, front. Exactly. I see, I see. Well, you, you'd mentioned that the primary goal of either one of these operations from the front or the back is primarily to stop the process. Um, let's talk a little bit about results from, from all of these things. Uh, what is the expectation if I'm a patient and I decide I'm going to have to have surgery? Let's just summarize what a reasonable expectation, realistic expectations of what you can gain from this surgery. And corollary to that is, does it last? Great questions. Um, the expectations are that the progression of the myelopathy will stop once the pressure is taken off the spinal cord. Most people tend to get significantly better within six months of the surgery, and usually even much faster than that, six weeks to three months. And the improvement will continue for 18 months after surgery. Most people don't have problems, again, at the areas that we're operating on. Now, sometimes, for example, if we only do one level in the front of the neck, there's nothing that's saying that problems can't occur above and below that just because of the patient's predisposition to it. Um, but for the areas we operate on, rarely, very rarely does the problem come back. Okay. And you'd mentioned that, that you're going to uh, begin to see improvement for six months, maybe even longer. Yes. Um, and then it, it, at one point it'll stabilize and you, you sort of are as good as you're going to get at that point. Exactly. Um, let's move to something that, that obviously we as, as surgeons don't like to talk about a lot, and that is potential complications. I mean, sure. What can go wrong with this procedure? Sure. I think the n first complication everyone worries about when they talk about spine surgery is paralysis. Oh my gosh, what's What's the risk of me waking up and, and having an injury to my spinal cord? Uh, fortunately, nowadays, with our new technologies, including uh, great operating and microscopes so we can see everything we need to do, and spinal cord monitoring, which actually monitors a patient's spinal cord throughout the surgery and can tell us if anything's going wrong, as well as the improvements in the anesthesia and surgical training. Patients, uh, surgeons who are fellowship trained and only do spine surgery tend to have a fair amount of experience with this. The complication rates are extremely, extremely low. The risks of something like paralysis or 
likely one in 2,000, give or take a little, and depending on the severity of the problem. The other kind of complications are the typical surgery kinds of complications, maybe bleeding a few tablespoons. Most patients do not require any sort of transfusion from this. As with any surgery, there's a minimal risk of an infection that's usually well taken care of with some uh, in, uh, antibiotics. Um, usually from the surgery in the front, the throat's a little sore for a few days afterwards, um, sometimes up to a few weeks. Rarely uh, people can have uh, problems with their voice um, for extended periods after surgery um, because there's a nerve that goes to the voice box that's near the spinal cord there. Um, that's why I always do my incisions on the left side of the neck because the nerve on that side is a little more protected than the nerve on the right side of the neck. Although either way you go in, the, the risks are quite low. Probably in general, if you put all of the risks together, um, they're probably left less than half a percent for significant ongoing complications after procedures like this. Well, it sounds like clear, clearly, given a very serious condition, that the, the surgical risks are very uh, acceptable, I think, especially given the new techniques we have today. Do you have any any advice that you would give to a patient who is faced with making this decision? Obviously, this is a serious decision and uh, a serious problem. Anything we haven't talked about that you would want to convey to patients that are faced with trying to either decide whether they need evaluation or faced with the, the decision about um, whether to, to proceed on with surgery or not? No, I think the, the first question is, you know, if you've if you've seen our discussion and, and have some of these symptoms, it's worthwhile pursuing the evaluation of the neck and getting that MRI scan because the diagnosis is one of the hardest things. And then getting in to see a good fellowship trained spine surgeon is really important. Mm -hmm. I would make sure that the patient and that surgeon have a good relationship and develop a good understanding. And if patients are uncomfortable for whatever reason and want to make sure that surgery is really the right option, get a second opinion to, to check, you know, go to the, uh, your local university, go to the local uh, uh, other spine practitioner who has a good reputation and see if they agree. Um, but make sure you're comfortable. And this really is a problem that if you're having symptoms, you will need to have surgery. And the sooner we get to it, the better the results. One final question, that is, a lot of patients, you know, end up going to their regular medical physicians for problems. So if I'm a patient and I think that I might have these symptoms, and I go to my, my regular primary care physician, who may not be as familiar with this, and, and I'm reassured the, the primary care physician says, well, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong. Let's watch this. I think from our discussion that you, we've just had, you would probably say that's probably a bad idea. I would, I would say that's a bad idea. And, you know, it's, it's, and it's not the primary care physician's fault. Right. I mean, they, they have such a phenomenal breadth of knowledge. Unfortunately, this is one of those problems that really, in, there's so much to learn in medical school that it's one of those problems that's not really touched upon. And if it is, it's 15 minutes and four years of schooling. It's the spine surgeon's job to, to know it. And if you think you have these symptoms, make an appointment with, with your spine surgeon, have a good evaluation, have them listen to your history, and then, get, and then have them figure it out. We're really the experts for this sort of problem. We're the ones who should be making the diagnostic and, and therapeutic treatment decisions. Yeah, I think that's, that's good advice, and I, I like the way you put it. I think that you're right. We can't all know everything. Right. And uh, this is one thing that not moving quickly or, or not being prudent can result in permanent damage. Exactly. Thanks, thanks a lot for helping us uh, understand this better, and uh, thanks for taking such good care of your patients. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching.